Yeah, there's definitely something in there. Will you get it out? You know what? I always carry my forceps from anatomy. Of course. No, sit still. Ow. I think that's a tick. Oh god. What if it has lime? Actually guys, what you have there is a soft tick. This type of soft tick isn't known to transmit any diseases at this time. It is, however, a parasite. Ah, parasites. Nothing more exciting than little creatures that inhabit your body and feed off your insides. Parasites come in all shapes and sizes. Ticks actually aren't on your insides. They're on your outsides. An ectoparasite. These pesky little arthropods embed themselves in the epithelium and feed off their host blood. Okay, so what kind of soft tick is this? What a great question. Let's talk taxonomy. Kingdom? Animalia. Phylum? Arthropoda. Class? Arachnida. Subclass? Acari. Superorder? Parasitiforms. Order? Ixodida. Family? Argacidae. Now this is a family of soft ticks, including 193 species. Our genus? Otobius. Odo is a prefix meaning ear, so keep that in mind. And the species? Is Magnini. It was named for Dr. Magnin, a scientist who was so into parasites like ticks, some might even call him a lunatic. Although it's named for him, a man named Duguay actually discovered the tick in Guanajuato, Mexico in 1884. Since then, it has spread all over the globe, but we'll get to that later. Dear Diary, there was a time in my life when everything was new, the world was bright. After 18 days in an egg, I hatched, and it was just me and my small family of 500 brothers and sisters. We had two months to find a host every man and woman for themselves. Many didn't make it. I was one of the lucky ones. Dear Diary, it's me again, Bloaty. It's early spring and I'm still a larvae. The dew clings to the grass. I wait, sometimes in the grass, sometimes in the hay patiently for an aloof host, hopefully a cow. Something in me just tells me they are the most ideal. Then I see her, filled with nourishment, unsuspecting. That was the most exciting time of my life. Dear diary, still bloaty here and still a larvae. I made my way to her ear canal and I took five to 10 days of her blood. I gorged myself. Afterwards, I settled down and I molted into one of my three nymphal stages. Unlike other soft ticks who go on to multiple hosts, as an Atobius magnini, I stayed in that one cow's ear canal for the better part of my insignificant life. Attaching, engorging, and detaching multiple times with every nymphal molt. I'm a one cow kind of tick. Man, I was gluttonous. I was in an ideal environment, so I only needed to molt twice as a nymph. She got the best months of my life. Dear diary, I needed to leave that cow. I was ready. I crawled out of her ear canal 
and made my way into the environment. I'd forgotten how cold ambient air was. I molted into an adult and no longer had any desire to feed. <sighs> Absorbing environmental moisture and nutrients. It's just not the same though. I did have a new desire though. I needed to find a mate. The modern dating scene is great. A lot of great guys on Tictor. The downside that I really should have seen coming. I am forever laying these eggs. I don't know when it'll stop. I feel like I might continue to lay eggs until the day that I die. Dear Diary, this will be my last entry. I am old and so cold. Six months it's been since I molted into an adult and I've been laying eggs the whole time. What was the point of it all? Was this my purpose? It's time to go. I'm spent. Man, Plody, that was dark, but informative. Life of an Otobius Bednini is no joke. But where do these ticks come from? Where did it all start? Let's go to my friend, epidemiologist and meteorologist, rain or shine. Thanks, Bill. Let's start with epidemiology. Atobius is endemic to North America, with concentrations in the tropics and subtropics. Atobius' original definitive host is the pronghorn antelope, a native to the American Southwest. I think you mean Antelope Carpa Americana, right? Right, Bill. Other wild hosts include mountain sheep, Virginia deer, and mule deer. The distribution of this tick extends from Western Canada, through the U.S., Central America, and South America. Encroaching agricultural efforts expose domestic species to the parasite. Global spread is now a result of well-concealed ticks in the ear canals of exported livestock. It is now prevalent through Western South America, the Galapagos, Cuba, Hawaii, India, Madagascar, Southeastern Africa, and Australia. Whew. Additionally, climate change needs to be considered. As the Earth gets hotter, the inhabitable zone of Otobius is expanding. To get an up-close and personal look at Otobius, let's take a trip down under with our naturalist in the field. Afternoon, folks. I'm Stephanie Irwin, and what we have here is a herd of beef cattle. Prime prey for our friend, the Spinosia tip, Otobius magnini. Now these gnarly little critters, they're only parasitic in their larval and nymphal stages. And what they do, they crawl into those big floppy cow ears and settle in for the feed. Let's take a closer look. Gotta find them in the dirt crevices. Oh, what a little beauty! Now, these ticks, like other soft ticks, have a leathery coat instead of a hard chitinous scutum. You can't see their mouth parts from the dorsal surface. The larvae have got three pairs of legs, but the nymphs and adults have four. Isn't she gorgeous? You're alright, mate. Settle down, you're all right. Now their mouth parts are so cool. They've got a hypostone which helps them anchor into their host ear. They've got chalicerae which surround the hypostone and palps which help them find their host. And they've also got Tiny little spines projecting backwards, which further helps them anchor in. O. Magnini is known to be infected with coxaliosis, chew fever, tularemia, Colorado tick fever, and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Although its ability to transmit these pathogens to the host is still uncertain, 
What we do know though is they cause a lot of irritation, inflammation and even ulceration to the inner ear, otitis interna. If the infestation goes on for long enough, they can cause deafness, encephalitis and significant blood loss. What's more common than that though is secondary bacterial infections. Stephanie, enthusiastic as ever. We are now almost experts when it comes to this tick. But what do we do once our cows are already infested? Let's take a trip down to the cow barn with bovine vet extraordinaire, Dr. Calvin Klein. Got a call from Mr. Brundage this morning. Pretty sure we have some spinous ear ticks. It's actually pretty easy to diagnose. You just gotta look for the clinical signs. Watch for that head shaking. Look for uh, oral hematomas, and sometimes they have lesions up and around their ears, and that's just from persistent head rubbing. The whole thing, pretty painful, I imagine. Outside of that, if you can find the ticks, they're pretty pathognomonic. You can look at them under the microscope and identify that gross morphology. Or you can actually use a notoscope. All right, let's take a look. All right, girl. Yeah, those are spinous ear ticks. I'm thinking uh, we should remove them and start on a dose of topical biocides and watch out for that secondary bacterial infection. In reality, we don't see these ticks in the Northeast too often. They're more of a Southern tick. From my time in A&M, we saw them a lot more. In fact, I remember this one patient, she was basically full up to the brim. She had ticks up and around her ear, in the ear canal. She was basically deaf from all the damage they did. I can tell you, it's important to mitigate the potential for infection. Clean your barn. Cut down the tall grass. Tall grass, it's a perfect perch for these ticks. On top of that, keep the herd away from the woods. It'll help. While primarily a tick of cattle, we need to keep in mind that both dogs and humans have been found to be parasitized. In fact, most mammals are susceptible. Of those infected, like our cow friends here, secondary bacterial infections have been associated with prolonged feeding. Those bite wounds, they make perfect opening for bacteria. And they're not the only one to take advantage. Ah. Screw worms also get in there. Together, separately, they feed off the blood can be fatal for these guys. Additionally, while rare, Metobia saliva can cause paralysis. The effect can actually be reversed if you remove the tick. Really, the best thing you can do for these guys is give them medicated ear tags. Thanks, Dr. Klein. That was very informative for all our listeners. Now let's check back with our friends in the woods, see how they're holding up. Geez, Bill. Thanks for all that info on Otobius Magnini. I'm still a little worried though. What do you think I should do? Probably just clean it with some soap and water, stop the infection. I mean, we learned from Steph that it's probably not Lyme. That makes me feel a little bit better. Well, that's our show. Remember, one, Otobius Magnini is a soft tick that parasitizes the ear canal of cattle. Two, they have a unique life cycle in which they only feed as larvae and nymphs on one host. Three, endemic to North America, they are now distributed worldwide as a result of agricultural exports. Four, pathologically we're concerned with inflammation of the ear, oral hematomas, rupture of the tympanic membrane, blood loss, and secondary bacterial infections. Five, clinical signs include head shaking, ear lesions, and tick presence making this type of parasite easy to diagnose. Well, that's all I have for you today. The clock is ticking, and I gotta go.